Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. So great that you're here with us again. We're just going to give you one more minute for other people to arrive, but um, as I've put in the chat, please do let us know where you're watching us from so we can see who's on this call. So we'll just give it one more minute and then we'll get going. Okay, so I can see we've got people from, we've got Texas, we've got Durban, we've got uh, oh, Lewa Wildlife Conservancy in Kenya. Hello to all of you. Tallinn Zoo in Estonia, uh, Poland, Upper New Zealand, that's where I'm watching from as well. Arizona, Edinburgh. Excellent, so we're gonna get going now. Um, hello and greetings to you all. Um, Welcome to the seventh ISD webinar in the series. As a webinar, these uh, are designed to help you unpack social change for conservation. It's been specifically created by the ISD board to support you in the, uh, the training and helping you to meet this new strategy. So today we're all about chapter seven, which has the title of optimizing training and professional development in conservation education. I'm Dr. Sarah Thomas. I'm Head of Conservation Advocacy and Engagement at Auckland Zoo in New Zealand. I'll be your host and moderator for today's webinar. Uh, and thanks to Kim, who's going to be our uh, tech supervisor for today as well. And she's based in St. Louis. Now, we've got four brilliant speakers for today. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Dave Johnston from the Wildlife Conservation Society uh, in uh, USA. Then we have Charlotte Smith and Lindsay Marston from Chester Zoo in the UK and the Antoinette Costa from Lisbon Zoo in Portugal. So just a bit of housekeeping before we get going with our talks. Um, as you know, please be aware that this uh, webinar is being recorded and the recording will be posted on the IZE YouTube channel. And by staying and participating, you consent to being part of this recording. And hello to all the viewers that are watching this later on that YouTube channel. Um, and if you've missed any of the previous webinars, you can find them all there. As this is a webinar, all the viewers will be on mute, but you can use the Q&A box or the chat box to ask any questions. And the format will be that we'll have our three speakers, four speakers, uh, and then we'll have a, a panel session. So if you've got any questions for any of your speakers today, please put those in. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna run a couple of polls just to see where we're at with the strategy. And we've done this for every single time. And hopefully if you're watching live, you can see those polls right now. For those of you who are watching later, I'm just going to tell you what the polls are so you can uh, know what we're talking about. The first one asks to choose your IZD membership level. So are you an institution member, individual member, associate member, not a member? And how did you hear about this webinar? Is that through social media, the website, through an email, through the, your regional representatives? And that just really helps us to know what kind of people we have on this call. So Kim, when you're ready and people have responded, we can uh, close us out and see what the results are. All right, I'm gonna close this poll in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so let's see where we're at. So um, hopefully again, if you're watching live, you can see the results. So I can see that 53% um, of our viewers are institutional members. Um, and 59% uh, so of most people heard it from the IZD email. So it's really good to know uh, where, the, where we're kind of um, uh, connecting with you and communicating with you. Um, we also have another poll, which is about where you're at with the uh, World Zoo and Aquarium Conservation Education Strategy. So hopefully if you're watching now, you can see that uh, second poll. Um, and it, it asks what stage are you at uh, implementing this strategy? Have you read the document, but nothing else? Have you watched previous chapter webinars and those were helpful? Have you had conversations with colleagues about what, how you want to implement the strategy? Uh, and or is your organization starting to make a plan to implement changes? Or are you not sure? So have a think about that and pop your answer in our poll now.
I know this one has a few more words to read. Yeah. But I, I am going to close it in five, four, three, two, one. Great. Thanks, Kim. So again, you can see the results and we, we hold on to these to see how things have changed over the different webinars. And so we can really understand uh, where our viewers are at. Um, if you look at the results, it's quite a mixed bag. Um, the highest one um, is that people are watching the, the chapters and they were helpful, which is brilliant to hear. And that's why we're doing them. Um, but we also see that 29% um, of you are starting to make a plan and how you can implement the changes uh, to meet these recommendations. So that's really great to hear. So thanks, Kim, for that. Um, so we've got seven webinars um, in the series and we'll just move on to the next slide just to see where we're located. Um, we had, you know, this is a seventh out of eight and a, a date for your diary is early December for that last one, um, strengthening the evidence of conservation education values of zoos and aquariums. Um, and it means that we have these eight chapters, eight webinars, and because they are recorded uh, and are on the ISAD YouTube channel, you can go back and rewatch them um, again and, and get that information. The other things I do want to share, uh, hot off the press, we've got some new translations for the World Zoo and Aquarium Conservation Education Strategy. Um, following the link that I've put in this slide, uh, you can now see that we have several different translations. We always want more. So if you feel that you could offer a translation to, in your own language and um, to the World Zoo and Aquarium Conservation Education Strategy, do get in contact. But it's really exciting to see a, a year from launch, we have it now in several different languages. And then just because it's next week, I'm gonna put this slide on just to give a highlight to um, the International Day of Zoo and Aquarium Educators, which is uh, next Thursday, the 11th. Um, and you'll see, have seen through the emails and through social media that you can join your regional representatives uh, for a coffee chat, which is an informal discussion, really um, making your networks, um, uh, thinking about how, you know, who else is in your region and really having a great discussion about conservation education. So I thought I'd just share that before we get to the, the main topic. So um, just moving on to the recommendations for chapter seven, as I said, it's about optimizing training and professional development in conservation education. And you'll see that on this slide, there are three recommendations that cover different aspects of training and professional development. And the first one thinks about ensuring that those that are leading the conservation education in your zoo and aquarium have the necessary experience and qualifications and are responsible for implementing their conservation education plan. The last two are really interesting, and I feel that they are a strong call to our CEOs, to our leadership team, to really support staff and volunteers who are involved in conservation education. Firstly, to be active in those local, regional and international kind of networks and meetings. And secondly, to support them to, to have professional development and training to meet the, the kind of requirements of a, an ever evolving field of conservation education. And so it's really important for chapter seven that we acknowledge that if we want you to do all these different things that we have in the rest of the chapters, and we know that you know houses and aquariums are evolving, how we're connecting with our audiences, how we're delivering our programs is changing. So this is a really key element for the World Zoo and Aquarium Conservation Education Strategy that we acknowledge that we need to have that commitment around supporting our staff, volunteers who are involved in conservation education to help us get there. So um, what I'm going to do now is um, we've got four fantastic speakers that are going to talk through some of their work. Um, keep thinking of those questions that you're going to ask in the panel session. And we're, we're now going to go over to our first um, presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing and then we're going to go over to uh, Dave Johnston, who is the Director of Professional Development at the Wildlife Conservation Society. And he is also newly elected to the ISD board as a regional representative for North America. So over to you, Dave. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me for this. This is uh, my favorite thing to talk about is staff learning. Um, so I was really excited to get the invite to talk about this. Uh, so as Sarah said, my name is Dave Johnston. I am the Director for Professional Development at the Wildlife Conservation Society. Um, and my role is to really look at teacher learning and teacher needs um, programmatically. So our audience members that I mostly work with are teachers. 
that makes me kind of uniquely situated at WCS to think about our staff educators and their needs and how we can best support them as well. So that kind of sets me up to be the person at WCS that fits that first bullet point in the WAZA strategy, having somebody who really thinks about this on a regular basis. I recognize that not every institution has the ability to do that. So I'm just gonna share WCS's journey, but I would love to um, encourage you to reach out and we can talk about it. You know, Even if you can implement some of these things, that would be really cool. I would be really excited about that. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is how we go about staff development and learning at the Wildlife Conservation Society. It's really focused on that third bullet in the WASA strategies, which is how do we support a culture of always learning about our practice um, professionally. And we've taken the stance of WCS that we want to go fully in on this. Um, we've really committed to doing this work. Um, I've worked at a lot of smaller institutions where we weren't able to commit quite as many resources towards it, but I think it is uh, a really good approach to kind of give you an idea of what it could look like if you had the ability to do some of these pieces. Um, so let me just start by kind of framing how I come to this conversation. So I work for the Wildlife Conservation Society. I'm based out of New York City. Um, I oversee all of our teacher and our higher education programming at all five of the facilities here. If you don't know this map, that's New York City. Um, Bronx Zoo is up at the top and the New York Aquarium is all the way at the bottom. And you know, public transportation, it takes you a solid two hours to get from the Bronx Zoo to the New York Aquarium. And I do programming at all five of those for teachers. Um, and it also means that the way we're structured at WCS is that each of those educate each of those facilities has an education team who is responsible for delivering programming for families and schools at that facility. But because we're a really large organization, we also have teams like mine that work across all five of the facilities. Altogether, our education department is about 70 to 80 full-time people. When we're fully staffed right now, we're a little under because of COVID, but when we're fully staffed, that's the scope of what we're looking at. And I do staff development for all of them. So how do you do that? How do you do professional learning for all of them? Well, how I come to it is through the work that I do. So I focus on teacher education workshops. We work with about 1500 teachers in the New York City area. We think about what teachers' needs are. We think about how to help support them and give them resources that they can use in the classroom. Um, we also create digital resources for teachers. If you were at the IZE conference, you might have seen me present on FieldSite, which is one of many resources that we provide barrier-free that teachers can use in their classroom. And we also do graduate programming with uh, a partnership with the university. We have about 70 graduate students and many of them are working towards a master of arts in teaching of biological sciences. So again, always thinking about how teachers are thinking. So I was asked by my director to head up our staff development plan, our strategy for that internally. And the way we go about doing that is threefold. Um, we have three different levels in which we continue doing staff development for all of our educators once they join our team. And the first is our Introduction to Conservation Education course. So every educator who works at one of our facilities or across all five of our facilities is asked to attend a three-day course. And that course covers things like educational theory, typical strategies that we use, um, but it also shows us WCS as an organization? What are our strategic goals? What's the work that we do around the world? How can we highlight that in the programs that we use? Um, and um, this year, we're, we're going to be incorporating in the WAZA the education strategies this year as well as a good framing for what this looks like internationally as well. Um, the key to this uh, workshop is that it is product oriented. And what I mean by that is we actually ask every educator to come to this workshop with a curriculum or a lesson plan or an activity that they need to create or revise. And every day we build in at least an hour for them to sit 
and reflect and apply what they learned that day. So it really gets them excited about the work they're doing. It gives them immediate access uh, to that content and it allows them to start applying and working together to do that. So every new educator goes through this three-day course when they first start. Um, and uh, you can see they have a ton of fun, including Kelsey on the far left sticking her tongue out at me or far right sticking her tongue out at me. Um, but you know, it's all good work. Um, but that only covers the brand new staff. How do we keep staff learning throughout the school, throughout their time with us? We also do all staff professional learning series every single year. Now, this is where we start to really throw a lot of resources into the, tr the learning. Um, we actually shut down our operations for three days. We don't run any programs on these days. We take the hit on revenue and I, we take the loss on revenue where we, we actually turn people away for those days so that all of our educators can be freed up together to engage in professional learning. And what we'll do with that is identify a theme that is something that we think everybody in education needs to learn about this year. And we will dive deep into that learning over the course of those three days. Um, some of the past things that we've done, we've spent three days just thinking about what it means to understand our audience and to decide and determine whether our programming is successful. What does that look like? Um, we've spent three days, actually we did two years. So we spent six days just focusing on issues of equity and access thinking about who our audiences are and how we better attend to issues of equity. Um, we spent a full year focused on uh, digital learning. That was last year, you know, everybody had to switch to digital. So what does that look like? How do you do that successfully? This year we're focusing the whole year on wellness and uh, avoiding burnout because so many of our staff members are starting to burn out from fatigue. Um, this includes us all getting together as one large group. Now, right now, we can't do that in person because of COVID, but in the past, this means getting all 70 or 80 of us together in one space to run three days worth of training. Um, but it also means getting us out into the community. So working with our community partners, there are people who do this work really well in New York City. So we should lean on them. We should ask for their expertise and we should get out and actually see what it's like to do that work at those facilities as well. So that's what the, you're seeing in this picture here was we all went out to a recycling center and we spent the entire day out working with the people who are the educators at the recycling center to understand how they work with their community members. And then we think about how we can do something similar. Um, so that takes a big chunk of staffing time to be able to do that. Um, but it's not the only way that we engage, because if you remember, I said we have 10 teams at WCS. That's one big large group, but each team has their own strategies as well. So each team does their own professional learning too. So for my team, we do two days a year. Again, we shut down operations on those days. We don't run any programs so that we can all be together. And we alternate between professional learning. So for example, um, right before the pandemic, we went to the Intrepid Museum for um, Air and Space Science. They do a fantastic job of working with teachers of students who have special needs. And we wanted to learn from them. How do you do that? What does that look like in a museum? And how can we do that at our facility? And it's really just focused on those teachers because that's the audience my team really works with. But we also do team building. So this, this picture is from two weeks ago. Uh, one of my staff members is an accomplished sailor and she has a boat. So she took us out on the boat and we spent uh, you know, the most of the day out floating around in the Hudson River. And then we went and we had just a great team building lunch together as well. So just keeping people excited, keeping them learning, giving them something to look forward to and making sure that we're always on cutting edge and we're all think always thinking about what our needs are. Um, that's the approach that we go through for staff development at WCS. Um, we've got other things that I would love to talk about some other time, but I'm keeping an eye on time. So I'm gonna stop. Um, but here is my contact information. So please um, write it down, send me an email, give me a call. I would love to chat with you about um, ideas you might have as well. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dave. Um, if you wanna just pop your details in the chat, that's really helpful for our audience so they can just pick them up. 
I'm sure that um, you've got lots of questions for Dave. That was lots of information, some really great stuff going on uh, over there. So yeah, just uh, think of some questions and we'll get back to that in the panel session. We're gonna quickly um, move on, uh, moving from New York to Chester over the Atlantic to our, um, our next speakers. Uh, so we have uh, Charlotte Smith and Lindsay Marston. So Charlotte is the head of conservation education and engagement. And Lindsay is the volunteer program manager at Chester Zoo. So over to you. Thank you. Hopefully that's shared properly. Great. Yeah, um, perfect. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we develop our education staff. And then I'm going to hand to Lindsay to talk about how things are slightly different when you're working with volunteers, particularly because of the aims of our volunteer programme. So when I was putting this together, I started thinking about what do we, what drives our staff development? We're quite lucky at Chester. We don't have as big a team as WCS, but we do have a team of around 40 um, with lots of different specialisms. So I recognise that we do benefit from that. But I think a lot of what I talk about is in common to any organisation, whatever size. And we start with our organisational plan and what we're trying to achieve and thinking about, well, what skills do we need in order to achieve those goals? And for us, we just launched our conservation master plan, which has some big people education centred goals, particularly that we will empower 10 million people to live more sustainably before 2030. So much of our training and development is about how do we adapt and develop as a team to deliver the goals of our master plan and also thinking about the education strategy as well and how do we deliver that so over the last few years even pre-pandemic our approaches that we're focusing on in our plan include digital but also reaching out to new audiences is a big focus for us and working with young people so that's been a big focus for our training as well as some of the core educational skills and theory there isn't in the UK any recognised particular sort of training for zoo educators. We tend to come from all variety of backgrounds. So quite often when people join the team, they might need topping up with educational theory or more subject-based knowledge to do specifically with working in zoos and with our collection. And our training also focuses on succession planning and the individual needs of staff. So thinking about what their aspirations are, what are our aspirations to grow the team? What are the roles that they might grow into in the future? Not just how do they do their current job? And then I thought I'd share one of the tools we use, this slightly dotted diagram, which is probably quite hard to see, but I will, my email's at the end if anybody wants to look at it in more detail. It's a training matrix where we've essentially taken all of the roles in our department and put them on the left-hand side. And then across the top are all of the different types of training and development activity we have available. And then we code them as to whether or not somebody needs them as part of their induction, those are the little red blocks, whether it's something that we'd expect them to do within their first year in the organization, green is developing in role or advancement might be blue. So it's something that might be offered for them to really stretch or if they want to specialize. And we can't quite see on here is that it, this spreadsheet is quite huge and it includes lots of different categories. So subject knowledge, monitoring and evaluation, lots about different audiences, legislation and operational, which is the slightly more, I would say boring things around health and safety, copyright, data protection, but really important like safeguarding and things we all need to know as educators. And then more generic things around people management, strategy, leadership, communication, and behavior change, so modules on conservation psychology. A lot of this is delivered in-house. We use the specialist skills we have available. Some of it's delivered through reading. This isn't a massive list of training courses. It's very much things that people need to know. And then my final thing before I hand to Lindsay is some of the different ways that we deliver this across the team. So all individuals, which is the left-hand column, have personal development plans where they work one-to-one -one with their manager to develop the right plan for them as an individual. And that might include mentoring or coaching, not necessarily with their line manager, could be someone else in the organization, sometimes externally as well, peer review, shadowing or adding extra learning hours into their rotor. So if they're rotated to do a lot of delivery, we might add a learning hour so they have time to focus on their own development. 
We also do quite a lot of working groups. So where as an organization, we might have a specific campaign or focus, we might bring together a group from across the department to work around that and to develop resources and skills that they then share with the wider team and create these skill sharing sessions. We also do study visits, so going to other organizations within the zoo sector, but also beyond to look at particular techniques. I think it's always really good to challenge ourselves to look outside our sector as well as within it to see what else is out there. Are there different techniques we could be using? as well as giving people stretch projects to work on that can really help them develop a leadership skill or something else. And we use our team meetings to bring that together. So as well as having focus days of training, there's usually a bite-sized bit of CPD within a team meeting, um, either shared by somebody in the team. And we've also recently set up something which I've actually been really enjoying called Journal Club, which is just once a month, Somebody in the team picks a research paper, a chapter from, could be a chapter from the strategy, from what we're on, it could be a webinar they've seen, and they share it with the whole team, and then they host a discussion about how that applies to our work, and it's open to every team member to attend, and quite often they're recorded as well. And that's been quite a nice informal way of just keeping everybody focused on their own development and on learning and not assuming that we're kind of fully trained, but that there are always new things out there and we can share them with each other. And then we also have things you'd expect like how-to guides and organisationally, we're quite lucky we have access to quite a lot of e-learning, which tends to take care of that more kind of functional stuff like GDPR and data protection and copyright and those sorts of things. So that's a little bit of an overview of how we do things for staff. And I'm gonna to hand to Lindsay now to talk about how things are a little bit different when we're working with our volunteers. Thank you, Charlotte. So we are part of the same um, team at Chester Zoo, um, but our vision for volunteering is to create a thriving and inclusive volunteer community that contributes to our mission of preventing extinction. So we do already have quite a thriving community already. So we're working with around 200 to 250 volunteers every year at the moment. We take a strategic approach to recruiting our volunteers, and this helps us to ensure that volunteer opportunities reach lots of different people. We use various methods to attract underrepresented groups to volunteering. So that means working with community and youth organisations to help us to work with the groups that we want to attract. And we have recently been awarded with some new funding, which will help us to work with volunteers in their own communities. We also capture how you heard about volunteering information at the application stage. This helps us to understand which recruitment methods work well or which recruitment methods we may have overused. We want to make sure that we, we, we offer volunteering to a wide variety of people. So we're always looking for new ways that we can reach new audiences. And people choose to volunteer for various reasons. For some, it's a chance to gain this experience with a conservation charity, whereas for others, it might be a, a way to meet new people and develop friendships. We recognise that there are multiple benefits that people gain through volunteering. And when we design our programmes, we design them to meet those different needs. In general, our roles are open to anybody that has an interest in volunteering with us. We're not looking for people that have particular qualifications or work experience. And this makes our roles more accessible for different people. What we're concerned about is their motivation for volunteering and whether their values align with the values of our organisation. We look for people that care about our work and feel that they could make a difference to our organisation and to themselves through volunteering. In roles where we are looking for specialist skills, such as volunteering with children or vulnerable adults, we are ideally looking for people that have some experience, whether that's paid or voluntary. But again, generally, we're just looking for people that have that interest in the role and, then can, and that they can demonstrate that suitability with their attitude and their personality as well. So we use a mixture of written and video role descriptions for volunteers. We believe that role descriptions make volunteers feel inspired and motivated to get involved. They need to have clear descriptions of their tasks and responsibilities and how they'll make a difference as a volunteer. We outline the expectations and what they'll gain through volunteering as well. We also use video role descriptions to encourage inclusion and diversity because we sometimes reckon, we recognize that for some people that the written word can be a participation barrier. 
We try and make the process as personable as possible with open days, informal chats and an opportunity to meet existing volunteers. Can you click ahead, please, Charlotte? So we achieved the Investing in Volunteers Award for Best Practice in Volunteer Management in 2021. This has really enabled us to reflect on our whole volunteer experience and ensure that the way that we recruit, train and support volunteers is to a nationally recognised high standard. We offer training and development that's relevant to volunteer roles and the length of training is proportionate to, to its duration and its activities. Similar to staff, we also use a training matrix. It's not something that volunteers see though, it's for us to plan the training required for the different types of roles that we offer. And we decide how much of it we need to do at the initial stages and how much we can integrate into their whole volunteer experience. Volunteers generally volunteer a few hours a week alongside their daily commitments and their family lives. So it's important for us to make sure that their experience isn't overwhelming or too much like paid employment. We also adapt our training to meet the needs of volunteers. That includes youth volunteers, disabled volunteers, and SEN volunteers too. This includes using different training methods and also inviting different speakers and educators from across our organization to help us to train volunteers. So this includes directors, trustees, field program staff and operations team. We also include um, volunteers that are supported, that will support volunteers uh, with SEND or, or disabilities so that they can understand the training content too. Volunteers also shadow experienced volunteers before they start their solo shift. Shadowing is designed to boost the confidence of volunteers and help them to learn from their peers too. We also use, as you can see on the screen, um, a better impact volunteer management system to manage the whole volunteer experience from recruitment to exit. Better impact enables volunteers to log their volunteering time and other measurable information such as how many guests they interact with and how they felt about volunteering that day. Volunteers can gain digital badges for training, hours and years of service. Badges are a great motivator for volunteers and some of them are directly linked to e-learning modules, which makes them a lot more attractive for volunteers to complete. It's a great way for volunteers to see their whole contribution and we've tailored our reward system to ensure that volunteers are recognised for their contribution, whether it's 10 hours or four years. We see learning and development as an integral part of the volunteer experience, and we offer ongoing training and development, including talks with curators and zookeepers, self-directed learning hours, and specialist training such as sign language. We also have informal coffee mornings with staff and volunteers, and this helps create different peer learning opportunities. Um, it is a great way for them to develop their skills and help them to feel connected with a wider Chester Zoo team. For some volunteers, it can be really professionally beneficial because it supports them to gain this valuable experience that they need for education, internships or employment. For this ongoing learning and development that we offer, we also find that volunteers adopt more environmentally sustainable behaviours and take positive action for wildlife in their daily lives. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Charlotte and Lindsay. Uh, I think our audience, we, we've learned a bit about them as well. They, they all love a coloured matrix uh, and also the, the badges are getting a, a lot of praise in the chat as well. So brilliant presentation from you both. Um, Charlotte, you do have a question in the chat. We'll come to that in the um, panel discussion if you want to take a quick look at that. We'll move quickly along to our, our last speaker, uh, to Antionetta Costa. Um, we're going to move over to Portugal. Uh, and to Lisbon Zoo. Antoinette is the Head of Education at Lisbon Zoo and she's also the IZD Board Regional Representative for Europe and the Middle East. And your presentation looks beautiful, Antoinette, so off you go. Oh, um, yeah. you're still on mute. Uh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> I was, I was, I was mute. Thank, thank you, Sarah. So uh, I'm going to share my experience uh, in the last uh, 12 years in what concerns to building active conservation education advocates teams, and I will focus on, on the zoo educators um, freelance uh, teams because we don't have uh, volunteers in our uh, in our departments. And uh, who are these? Uh, volunteers? volunteers. They are university students that can lead different uh, groups from school groups to holiday camps 
uh, visitors um, or uh, from different events inside or outside the zoo. And they are the face uh, of the zoo conservation education uh, mission. They are scheduled uh, two programs according to their availability uh, and the zoo schedules uh, appointments. These freelance educators, educators usually stay with us uh, up to three to four years, uh, which lead us to an annual or biannual recruitment process to re reinforce uh, the team. Okay. Why? I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Lisbon Zoo has per year 700,000 visitors, uh, 75,000 uh, students per year, uh, 3,500 holiday camps participants, and we offer different uh, visitors conservation engagement programs, um, three holiday camps, uh, Easter, uh, Summer and Christmas. And to lead all these programs, we have a team from 40 to 80 uh, freelance uh, educators. And now I'm going to tell you about how we arrived at the methodology that we now uh, employ. So when I arrived to, to the zoo in uh, 2007, the process of recruiting, recruiting uh, educators for the freelance teams was done through advertisement at the various universities uh, in Lisbon. We received hundreds of CVs, very similar, uh, because most of them did not have any kind of work uh, experience. And from these hundreds of CVs, we choose about uh, 50 for interviews, uh, and then choose 30 for uh, 50 hours uh, theoretical training followed by a practical part, uh, which lasted between two to three months. And in the end, only 10 to 15 persons completed the entire training, which meant that the entire recruitment process had a duration of five months. So what to conclude? First, it's not possible to spend so much time recruiting educators that in the end don't finish their entire process. Uh, and second, the zoo uh, has unique um, education resources and the ability to offer theoretical, practical and on-site training from a perspective oriented uh, towards conservation education activities. So we it was decided to implement an annual training plan for university students from different areas who were interested in topics related to biodiversity conservation issues. And in the end, they would have uh, general tools to work in conservation education. And all workshops offers trainees the possibility of joining our zoo educators team. This way, we managed to have an annual database for recruiting new educators. And we developed and implemented two different workshops, one more scientific and the other more pedagogical, which complement each other and take place four times a year. So two fundamental workshops are part of our annual training plan, as I mentioned, MS mentioned above. So the first one is the Biodiversity Conservation Education Workshop and has the following content. So zoo mission and framework, IASA and WASA, uh, environmental perspectives, uh, a practical approach of flora and, um, and fauna, uh, diversity, threats in service of uh, ecosystems, uh, creativity in, in good environment practices in biodiversity uh, conservation. So the second one is uh, about environmental education leaders workshop has the following contents. Environmental education concept, the zoo uh, and uh, conservation, psychopedagogy and child uh, development, uh, child development theories, uh, skills of children age groups, environmental education techniques, the different types, uh, methodologies and communications. But uh, the strengths of conservation education depends on the quality 
and capacity of the teams. And this begins with training. Teams training ensures that scientific knowledge, commitment, pedagogical strategies, and communications are in accordance with the zoo vision and mission. We apply the training application evaluation methodology, uh, both in initial and continuous training. First, we start with workshops, as I mentioned before, where we take the potential candidates for a recruitment followed by a specific zoo educators training. And in this training, the contents are divided into zoological, scientific, pedagogical contents, communication strategies and skills, uh, storytelling, theatrical uh, expressions, vocal and body language, uh, interaction with different audiences and language adaptations. And followed by a practical training where the trainees attend to school uh, educational programs. Uh, and after attending to four uh, programs, they have an assisted practice with a tutor, a senior uh, zoo educators. And the final evaluation uh, consists in monitoring a full program by the team coordinator. And in the end, a meeting is held to discuss the positive and negative points and an evaluation form is filled in together, so trainee and trainer, in order to the new educator can continue to work on its uh, evolution. Finally, we have uh, continuous training and evaluation practice, regular evaluations with complementary training throughout the year. Educators are always able to watch peer programs to allow for continuous improvement and team uh, performance. So uh, about the zoo educators main evaluation aspects, so our preparation of the conservation education program, uh, commitment and motivation, explanation of zoo rules and function, content domain, scientific and programmatic, Communication skills, voice, tone, rigor, and adequacy to the group, discourse structuring, group management, interaction use uh, of previous knowledge and experience, group control, manage, manage of unforeseen uh, events, and time management. So, and the, veil, the evaluation parameters uh, from zero to five include all teams and are always discussed and participated between all parts uh, to promote continuous improvement. Last year, for example, the team average was 4.6 across all parameters and the best was the interaction with audiences uh, that was 4.8. Uh, and the most needed of improvement was the speech the structure, 4.1. Uh, so this gives, gives us measurable, uh, measurable advances, skill teams, and strong active conservation advocates. So, and that's it uh, that I, I wanted to share with you. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate. And Great, I, thank I, you I, so much, Antionetta. Um, okay. Perfect. If you want to put your uh, email yeah. address in the chat box so people can yeah. get in contact. Um, excellent. So, you know, we've we've heard from um, four great speakers, lots to think about. Uh, for our panelists, you'll see that there are some uh, questions in both the chat and the Q&A box. Um, and so we'll, we'll kind of get on to those now. Um, the first one that came in uh, for you, Charlotte, was talking um, first of all, it says, thank you. What a great framework. Um, people just love a color coordinated matrix. Um, but can you say a bit more about the journal club? Um, and so it's something we've run on and off for a couple of years. It's been sort of every so often we need to pick it up. And I'll be really honest, every so often we pick and say, oh, remind ourselves we've got out the habit. But now we have a, another spreadsheet where people sign up month by month to say what they're going to do and what one of the ways that we do push it along is if anybody goes to a conference or a webinar or is supported to attend something, then they kind of have to host something when they come back to share what they've learned in a discussion. 
but in between time, particularly around our conservation mm. master plan and our target around empowering people, which we've done a lot of wrestling with, how do we measure the outcomes? How will we really know if we've empowered somebody that we are sending people away to find relevant papers and then to share them? And then all you do is usually that person sets a date and sometimes it's in the canteen, sometimes it's online. When we were all, the zoo was closed this year, we did them all on Zoom and we just sent a Zoom link with a link to the paper or the webinar. And then usually some key questions about how does it apply to our work? And ideally we get a couple of actions out of it that are then shared with the whole team that we've learned this. And we think this is where we might implement it in our practice. Because I'm always really keen that I think quite often you go to so many things, but actually having something quite tangible about how's this going to change what we do and having a group of people who then can champion that. Um, but it's something you need to kind of give people time to go and plan the session and remember to keep it in our programme. Because it's quite easy for a couple of months to go past and go, oh, who was supposed to host the last one? Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right. Having that kind of set moments in time and that accountability to have the discussion is, is really useful. Something that we did see at the, um, the conservation education conference a couple of weekends ago, people talking about setting up uh, like a journal club for the strategy. So um, you taking each chapter in turn, uh, setting a date to, to read it as a group and then having a discussion both about what it's about but also how it then can be applied in practice. So it may not need to be a, you know, a super complex academic um, journal article, something like the strategy, if you want to kind of break it into chunks, use your networks, whether that's people in your own um, zoo and aquarium or those that were in your region, I think that's a really great way to start kind of socializing the strategy. Any of our other panelists um, set up similar kind of reading groups and clubs that they want to comment on? Dave? Yeah, we take a very similar approach to what Charlotte does. Um, we have the same expectation that if somebody goes to a conference or a presentation, they come back and present that. And I think that's a really good way. We call it um, PD for PD because my team is a professional development team, so professional development for professional development. Um, and that's been a really um, exciting way to kind of maximize the learning for conferences because I think we all get in... We all go and we get really excited and then life happens and then we don't get a chance to apply. So having that extra piece where it's specifically, um, it's part of the ex part of the job is you have to come back and facilitate a discussion about how we're going to apply something that you learn that you're really excited about. That keeps people uh, engaged and it spreads that learning across as many people in your team as possible. So we do a similar thing and I think it's a really great strategy because um, I would love to attend a, a bunch of conferences. I can attend one a year, um, but I love when my team comes back and shares so I can get the yeah. most benefit. Yeah, fantastic. And that really links to the, the third recommendation about continuous professional development and training. And I think what we need to move away from is that it's got to be a course. We've got to go somewhere, especially now we're doing a lot of stuff online that, you know, as many of you talked about, there's such a range of different things that are, can be included on the job training, team building, personal reading, you know, having these moments where we can really kind of have a think about, you know, somebody's gone somewhere, but how do the, it is then shared out and applied? Great. So we'll, we'll move on to our, our next question. Let's have a look to see what's in, in the chat. Um, so uh, one for Lindsay, if we come to you next. Um, so this is from uh, Rachel Arnold and she's asking, you mentioned the volunteers have shown changes in their environmental behaviours. What are some of the ways that you're measuring those changes? Um, so one of the main ways that we do that is um, in the first six weeks when volunteers join us, we ask them to complete a survey. And this survey is mainly about the volunteer experience, but it's also a kind of baseline as to where they feel that they are personally at in terms of their knowledge of nature, sort of how capable they feel in terms of making a difference, or even like their um, how environmentally friendly they behave into they behave in terms of their behaviors and what they do at home. Um, and then after a year, we'd have the same survey again. So those similar, those same questions are in our annual survey with volunteers. 
and you know we do see changes in those in those survey responses um, at the moment we're at a stage where we want to we want to develop that again so we are going to be looking at one of our particular campaigns around sustainable palm oil and to see just how much volunteers are taking on that learning and how much their behavior is changing in their daily lives so this is something that we want to expand our learning on and we want to be able to delve into that a little bit more with our mm. volunteers and um, so the annual surveys for now um, but another thing we do it's really informal as well so you know yeah. just that anecdotal time with volunteers through coffee mornings or I mean we see volunteers before they go to shift every every time they go out we see them and those conversations with volunteers you know we're really sort of hearing the things that they're doing in their daily lives as well um, and it's very sort of on topic at the moment as well we've just finished a summer of a um, sustainability um, exhibition at the zoo so talking about sustainable behavior has been a real hot topic and you know, so um, we've been able to really have an understanding from volunteers just what they do in their daily lives as well. Yeah, great you. Thanks. Um, so we'll come to a question which I think, you know, um, is relevant for all our, our speakers. Um, uh, and this is asking, like, what would you recommend for smaller teams? How are they going to start when they're planning staff training if there isn't anything already established? And that's a really good thing because obviously, you know, uh, we have um, three larger um, zoos and aquariums on, on as our speakers and so it is a great one saying what happens if you're a small group on your own and you haven't started um, th th this training and professional development uh, piece where are you going to start and Antoinette if I can come to to you first um, uh, for some comments and then we'll we'll hear from the other speakers uh, yeah, hi. Um, so this is uh, these were three uh, great uh, examples. Uh, well, it's larger. They are larger um, institutions, of course. But uh, I think um, we should look for uh, for for people for people that really are interested in the in the zoo. You know, because uh, when I started uh, with uh, university uh, university students um, they were they all were very interested but um, they 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 really had no idea what the zoo mission what uh, the conservation education was was all about so I think uh, planning some sessions uh, smaller sessions uh, and together university students uh, interested in this kind of uh, of issues I think it's better because uh, sometimes when we are away from the zoo world we don't realize um, uh, our visions and missions and and uh, they are expecting other other kinds of things that's what i i, I I'm, my results uh, from yeah. my previous experience so i really uh, suggest that yeah okay absolutely i think yeah. you're right having those i think about the initial conversations really thinking about your vision and mission and, and and starting that kind of thinking about what do you want your staff and volunteers yeah. Yeah. to be trained in is something yeah. that any any size of zoo and aquarium can do uh david we come to to you next for a few words of wisdom sure um so in teacher education we have a saying which is that teachers make the worst students um, and I think that's zoo educators as well. Um, I think we, we take things very personally and we think that we know everything and we're very proud of what we've created. Um, so what I would recommend is um, if you're starting in the beginning, um, let the teachers identify, let your staff identify what they want to learn about because they're going to get excited and then education is going to become embedded in. It'll be accepted that we learn as a group then you can start bringing in some things that you think they need to learn that they might not want, they might not recognize on their own. Um, because now you will have built in the will where they're excited and they know that learning is okay, um, but they might not be ready. They don't know what they don't know initially. So start them off on things that they want and then go from there. Yeah, fantastic. And then anything to add, Charlotte, Lindsay? Um, I'd probably add two things. One from experience in previous roles of being the only educator in an organisation. 
and that's about building your network and getting out and going and finding other collections or places that may be in a similar position and visiting them and sharing ideas. Um, so I think there's a massive benefit in actually just spending time with other professionals. And if you're not lucky enough to be in a big team where you have that every day, making sure that you make time. And we now you know, can do that quite easily online as well through social media channels. And then I'd probably echo what Antonetta said about really prioritizing if you're not gonna have lots of time for it, really thinking about, what's in my plan this year that I need to develop the skills to do or that I want to become more expert in and then really looking at where you can go and find those whether it's a visit or resources online or something like that that or papers that you can read and making time for it yeah great and uh, you're absolutely right you know those networks are, are so useful you know, I feel that often we you know, we're, we're, we're living parallel lives to so many different Susan aquariums, museums, science centres, even like, you know, into different fields like art galleries and, and other museums. How can we make those networks? And we have a, a, a range of different kind of networks already for IZD members. So remember, we've got the um, Facebook page. We've also got the website. You've got your regional coffee chats um, next week. So that's a great way to start kind of networking. Also, um, there is a, another one, the EASA Conservation Education Facebook group. But that is a, a global network. So again, you know, starting to think about how you might want to meet that second recommendation about building those local, regional and international uh, networks. And I, I think hopefully that gives some ideas of how you might want to start those, those training pieces and going forward. Um, Lindsay, there is a question in, in the Q&A box that you might want to answer uh, directly, but we will come over to, uh, to Dave. There is a question for you uh, from Nio, Kira Nio. Um, and she says uh, she's wondering about the educated training days. Um, how is it decided what the focus is on and how do you seek the experts and places to engage for staff training, which I think is a great question. Yeah, great. Thank you, Naya, for that question. Um, that actually it builds directly off of what you were just saying, Sarah. Um, so how do we initially identify? Well, our education leadership team thinks about our, our strategy. Um, what's, what are our goals for this year? And um, we have a, a sense of what some of the challenges might be. Um, so we, we build off of that and we identify where we wanna go. But as far as identifying the speakers, it's all about that network building. Uh, it's all about um, all of us working together in our professional networks to identify. I don't. I have a good sense of the people in New York City, but I, I certainly don't know everyone. So if I'm looking for someone, I'll put it out to the staff, even the staff who are gonna be attending the training um, to say, hey, I'm looking for a speaker who's really good on this particular thing, who's got ideas. And inevitably somebody knows somebody who does it well. And that's how those connections start. Um, that networking piece is just critical. Yeah, fantastic. And I guess, you know, vice versa, people will want to learn from us and our, you know, our professional uh, practice. And, and how can we have that reciprocal relationship between zoos and aquariums and other um, places that um, are very similar to ours? So we've just got a couple of minutes left. Uh, I see we've got one question left uh, in our Q&A box, which is uh, for you, Charlotte. Uh, it's from Melanie Sorensen, and she's asking, how do you involve the human resource department in staff development plans? Or is the matrix for conservation education for is it department only? So how you know how does it go beyond your team into the wider organisation? Um, so the matrix is just us. It was something we decided to do as a department. Um, although we have shared it with our training and development manager. Um, actually, for a size of our organisation, we only have one person who looks after training um, and they tend to have to prioritise all the really essential stuff like making sure people who need to drive forklift trucks and do dangerous things can do them safely. So we do have other training as well, but they haven't got into the depth of the kind of matrices yet. So we share with them what we're doing and we collaborate with them very much around some of those more statutory things that are applicable across the organisation but we do take the lead and our management team take the lead on developing the matrix for our own specialism, really. Great. Um, I'm going to ask one final question, which is just a brief one for everybody. And this was around, you know, what's your key piece of, of training, professional development that you would recommend? Could be a course, could be a, 
something to read could be you know just a, a philosophy a way of thinking what key piece of training would you recommend to those involved on, on this call and involved in conservation education that really has kind of been your favorite been your useful um bit of training and professional that you've experienced in the in the last couple of um months or years uh who would like to go first dave you look like you may be ready to speak Sorry, unmuting. Um, yes, I was actually quickly going to Google because I was trying to remember the name of the author. Um, I will look it up in a second and I'm going to put it into the chat. There is a, an academic who focuses on informal science assessments and she has a series of, oh, it's Paige Keeley. That's her name, Paige Keeley. Um, she has a whole series of books that are on um, different strategies. So it gives maybe, if you have the entire series of books, you'll, you'll have about three or 400 different small little assessments that you can build into your science classroom that um, allows you to assess learning very quickly. That's been a great resource. We bought the whole collection and now we just make them available to our educators. They can borrow them like a library so that they can just get new ideas. Fantastic. Um, yeah, if you want to pop that in the chat, so we've got that resource. Uh, Antinetta, we'll come to you next. Um, what's your favourite, most useful top tip you can provide us? Well, uh, well, uh, of course, is the, the the world strategy because I really it's uh, and it's and um, and I'm really uh, I mean it uh, because uh, uh, zoos and aquariums are unique. Uh, learning environments and uh, this strategy um, fulfills our uh, our uh, is critical and brought us uh, an inclusive uh, framework uh, framework approach for all zoos and aquariums um, even if they are big institutions or small ones so I think it's not only to to, to scroll or, or to, to see the the the, the state case, the state cases the the state cases but to 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 attend the webinars to to and to to learn from it because it's it's really a fantastic document uh, and uh, and really uh, because we all want uh, to provide effective uh, conservation educators uh, mm -hmm. educations to connect visitors so and that's it. That's my suggestion. <laughs> Thanks, not, to go, not, not to go far. <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> uh, Lindsay, we'll, we'll come to you next. Any Anything that you found particularly useful that you can recommend? Um, yeah, so I really like something that's a global thing, which is called Engage. And it's, um, it's a website. It's um, the global voice of leaders in volunteer engagement. Um, you do have to become a member, but there are some free things on their website that you can read also. Um, so they cover things like um, research and volunteering, ethics, um, points of views as well from volunteer managers across the world as well. And um, they point you towards different podcasts as well. So um, through that, I've learned about the Advance in the Profession podcast, which is by Rob mm. Jackson, who's quite famous in the world of volunteering. Um, I, I think actually just volunteer, net, volunteer management networking is something that I just really enjoy. So I'm part of the yeah. BR's uh, Volunteer Managers Network. Um, I really enjoy that. And um, I actually only recently joined a lot of the educators networks as well. And I've just found that really, really useful as well to actually see see my role as well beyond volunteer management as well in mm. terms of being being an educator as well so um what i'm really saying is that connection with other humans in our profession is the most beneficial thing that i find yeah thank you so much and yeah if you want to just pop that uh, website link in the chat that'll be useful for our viewers and then lastly over to you charlotte anything to add to our conversation um probably builds on what Lindsay said. I think one of my most profound learning experiences was actually when I was very early career and I had a mentor for two years. I was in an organisation where I was the only person doing education and I found somebody who was a bit more experienced than me in another organisation who mentored me over a couple of years and I'd meet her probably only three or four times a year to look at professional development and talk about what I was doing and it had a really profound effect so I think to anyone who's on their own in an organization I'd really recommend finding yourself a buddy 
don't necessarily need to be more experienced, but somebody who can have quite focused professional development conversations with every few months to kind of help you keep going and troubleshoot those small things who's got that time for you. And I found that really useful when you don't have a manager or someone else in your organisation who can provide you with that kind of mentoring support. Great. Thank you. Uh, I realise we've gone five minutes over, but this is such a great conversation. I thought it was, uh, you know, worth to have that kind of final top tip. Um, we're going to end uh, by having a quick poll um, that just kind of gives uh, gives us some feedback. So for those of you watching later, I'll, I'll just um, uh, read this out. So for the first question is asking how valuable that you found this webinar. Um, so we want you to kind of just uh, have a think about um, where where you're at. Uh, and then the second one, uh, what would you like to see from future webinars? So we do have another one in December, um, but we're thinking about our 2022 series already, thinking what kind of things would be useful. Um, and we'll just give it a couple more seconds for people to fill in their responses. Okay, I'm gonna close I think it. And... Probably good to go, yeah. And then if we, we can see the, the results, Happily, um, you know, for for us, the organisers and our speakers, um, you know, we can see that 60% found it extremely valuable and 40% very valuable. So, you know, we've all had a great hour together um, and then we've got the right mix. You know, we, um, we we found that having our case studies and people talking about their experiences is really useful, um, but also the Q&A so we can uh, answer more um in-depth kind of pieces um, has been uh, excellent. So what we'll do now is I just wanna give a, a massive thanks to all of our speakers. It's been such a, an interesting hour. I've learned lots about different aspects of training and professional development. Uh, please do uh, register for our last webinar in the series, which is in December. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll say uh, goodbye and thanks.